The Standard Age podcast is for those with drive, conversations about the lives of entrepreneurs and those who have contributed to growing companies. You can now find episodes available on YouTube. Season one is already available, whereas subsequent episodes should all be online by the time the next episode of the Standard Age podcast drops in two weeks' time. Check out the Standard Age YouTube channel for videos to come. Now on to this week's episode. When I first moved to LA, I worked in marketing and PR for what was then a three-pronged business owned by Mike Ryan. Mike is a Hollywood stunt driver famous for doing stunts with semi-trucks, but alongside his driving, he owned a business responsible for sourcing and placing cars in movies and television shows. At the time, Mike was also only one of two guys racing a semi-truck at the esteemed Pikes Peak International Hill Climb, the second oldest race in America behind the Indianapolis 500. It was 2007 when today's guest, Brian Scotto, founded a magazine called Zero to Sixty. I was first in contact with Brian when he reached out about doing an article on Mike. Zero to Sixty was based in New York City, and coincidentally, I was going to be there the following week, so I suggested we meet for lunch and talk about it. The article went great, and the magazine was awesome. Twelve years later, Brian is now living in Long Beach, California, and heads up Hoonigan, a multimedia company best known for its production of Jim Conna videos starring Ken Block acrobatically driving an arsenal of tire-shredding cars. Collectively, the videos have amassed a viewership in excess of 550 million views. Given I've been a fan of effectively everything he's produced, I reached out to Brian about me now interviewing him, and he kindly obliged. His story is a fun one, and we conduct some serious car talk, as you can imagine. I thoroughly enjoy how he goes into what's been easy for him, as well as the challenges that opportunity can bring. We also get a backstage pass to what goes into making those incredibly viral videos. And it's fair to say you can hear Brian's passion in this conversation. He's well on his way to building an empire, but at the end of the day, he's as curious about what you have going on as he is about how he'll attract millions of eyeballs on the next YouTube video. I truly had a blast seeing them again, and I'm certainly excited to see what they have coming, so stay tuned to hear about it. I'm your host, Wesley Smith, and you're listening to the Standard Age Podcast. Brian, it's good to see you again. Yeah, man. It's 12 been, years later. Been a while. Yeah. Um, 3,000 miles on the other side. 3,000 miles. Uh, Mike is absent. Shout out to Mike. Yeah. Have you seen Mike recently? I, n- not since I've seen you. Okay. Wow. Oh, really? So that's the last <laughs> yeah, time? Yeah, that was the first and last time I'd actually in the flesh seen you both. So I actually run into Mike Ryan quite a bit now because, I mean, he's still so involved in stunt stuff here in California and, you know, in the Hollywood area that we, I'll be on sets and he'll just show up and someone will say, oh, we'd like to introduce you to uh, one of our stuntmen, Mike Ryan, and Mike look at each other and go, yeah, 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 we've done this a bit before. So Actually, you know, you know what? I had lunch with Mike once, Mike Ryan, my former boss, Mike Ryan Motorsports, Picture Vehicles Unlimited. Um, the guy that jackknifed the truck in Terminator 2. <laughs> yeah, uh, he w- drove the truck in, I think, a Metallica video. He's, he's, I mean, that's his specialty is yeah. doing crazy things with he's, semis. Yeah, um, he's a madman. Yeah. Um, so basically, we met through an interview that you wanted to conduct of him for your magazine, Zero to 60, which we'll get to. Yep. But uh, let's rewind for a hot second. Where were you born? Uh, I was born in New York, New York. Okay. Right. And grew up New York Hospital. Uh, I grew up in Queens, New York. Right yeah. on. So Mets. Hmm. Mets. Uh, Yankees. Yankees. Right yeah, on, which was weird because you know I I grew up in the in the eighties, early nineties, and I mean the Mets were the team, right? Eighty six Mets. But my grandfather was a Yankees fan, so he I just grew up around him watching games. So yeah, the Yankees were my, were my team, which is weird because I lived like within a stone's throw of Shea Stadium. Um, what did your mom and dad do? Um, both of my parents are research scientists. Oh, yeah. what field? So uh, my mother is uh, a molecular biologist and my dad's a biochemist. Right. Yeah. So uh, my mom has worked mostly in cancer research her whole life. So um, lymphoma, leukemia, stuff like that. My dad worked a lot in blood research. Uh specifically artificial blood cells for military use stuff like that so wow. you know 
soldiers get shot in the field and they yeah. need plasma to get back to, you know, some sort of hospital and creating kind of universal donor plasma was something that my dad worked on for a long time. He's retired now though. So he just sits at, well, he doesn't really sit. My dad doesn't sit at all, but when he does sit, he watches NASCAR, which is a new hobby of his, which is so weird. Cause I grew up and he never liked NASCAR. He was a open wheel kind of indie car guy. Yeah. But how do you he, get into NASCAR? Just cause it's on all the time, oh, <laughs> sure, coach. but he does that in gardening. Like that's it. That, that's what my dad does now. Those are so, both very yeah. meditative yeah, type of practices. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, and reads a lot. So, but yeah, no, they're both uh, research scientists and both kind of heavy in academia. My mom, um, my mom was at uh, Morrill Sloan Kettering, and my dad was at uh, at Cornell University. Like my most of my childhood, and my mom's now actually a va- vice chancellor of research over at Rutgers. And, nice. Yeah, my dad's enjoying retirement. So, awesome. Yeah. Well, obviously, you're with the Hoonigan brand moniker, Empire, mm-hmm. whatever you <laughs> want to label it. Um, what was your first car? Uh, my first car that I was mine was a 1995 Volkswagen Golf. Sweet. Um, yeah, I was like, I was big into BMX and a bunch of my friends at the time who were older than me all bought Volkswagens and they all had like Mark II and Mark III Volkswagens with roof racks and their BMX bikes on the roof. And I just kind of grew up around seeing that, uh, in like, you know, my local neighborhood. So I really wanted a Volkswagen saved a few years for it. There was two vehicles I wanted. I really wanted either a Volkswagen or a Land Rover Defender 90. Of course. (laughs) Defender 90s were like 12 times the price of a Volkswagen. So yeah. And that's really what kind of sent me down like the rabbit hole of really being into cars. I'd always was into cars but I, the whole Volkswagen scene and community kind of set that off for me. Sure. Were you always into modding them or like making them your own kind of thing? Uh, yeah. I mean, the first car I bought was already like partially modded. It was already lowered and on wheels. So pre-owned, you went with pre-owned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went with a, I bought a 1995 in 1997. So, you know, it was two years old and um, I really wanted a Mark I, but it, my parents didn't want me to have a car from like the early 80s. They wanted me to have something that was safe with an airbag. So, of course, the first thing I did was buy a car, remove the airbag, put it in a Momo steering wheel. <laughs> on a race seat and harnesses so like all of the stuff that you know the reason they wanted me to have a new safe car was kind of out but and then i bought a mark one like two years later but yeah no the the modding bud hit real quickly um i bef- you know before that i was into radio controlled cars and that was the same thing like you know you'd get a kit and then you change out the motor you change out the wheels you change out the suspension setup like i was always really into leaving nothing kind of stock so bmx bike same thing wow dope um so where did you end up going to college uh i went to university of vermont oh so, cool yeah i mean they uh they had a great uh undergraduate program in snowboarding so that's pretty <laughs> much why i went there um I, I actually went to school there for mechanical engineering uh i did two years there mechanical engineering and i probably spent more time snowboarding less time uh with the ti86 calculator so i <laughs> Uh, ended up transferring uh, from there to Polytechnic University, where I back in Brooklyn and uh, Long Island, where I did computer science for a semester. And I'll be honest, I was just chasing that because, like, think it's 1998, and there's like the tech boom, and there's just thousands of jobs in that space. My uncle had uh, started his own business, um, and kind of really the only. Well, I don't want to say the only real entrepreneur because my, my grandmother was an entrepreneur as well, but everyone else in my family kind of went that like scientist or lawyer route or something like that. Very academia. And my uncle was way more like, you know, the guy that was building something in his bedroom. Right. So he bi- he built his computer company uh, out of his business, out of his bedroom, grew it with his friends, you know, and then sold it for a good amount of money and had a, had a decent exit. So I, I was kind of watching all that. And thought, yeah, I can do computer science. And I was okay at coding. Um, and I don't, I think that way, but it just didn't really excite me. So uh, I then went to uh, Stony Brook University, which is uh, one of the state universities in New York. Um, and at this point, I'm on like the five or six year plan. Like I just keep changing my major. So like half of my credits don't transfer. Uh, and I took a class uh, that was a. You know, it was just an elective just to fill in kind of some spaces. And it really, it was something I was interested in, but it really was just a fit into my schedule. So at the time, 
I was working, um, you know, I was working and all, moving back to Queens. So I was living in Long Island when I first went to Stony Brook, and I wanted to move back to Queens where all my friends were. So I didn't want to be at school that much. So I was trying to put all my classes on a Tuesday and Thursday. So that way, you know, I was only there two days a week. And I took a class in uh, newspaper journalism, and that kind of changed the, my entire trajectory and career and everything. Wow. So what was your first gig out of school? Um, the first thing, I actually got an internship. And my internship actually ended up kind of, I won't say forced me to, to drop out, but the internship opportunity was so good that they offered me a job. And I just kind of, I was in this position where I had six credits left back at school and everything was, was, was working out. So I took an internship at a magazine called Mass Appeal. And Mass Appeal was this kind of cool culture mag in New York. Um, actually, Vice magazine sort of was, a, I want to say, a replica of Mass Appeal. Vice ended up doing a lot better in the end. But it was this cool kind of like attitude-y culture mag. It originally started as a graffiti magazine. Um, had a lot of, you know, kind of ties to the punk scene, the, you know, music scene, a lot of stuff in hip-hop, uh, cult, you know, culture and fashion. And I knew a guy who worked there he got me an interview with the editor was talking to the editor and you know and i had a background in things like graffiti i knew hip-hop i knew music pretty well um so i started writing for the for them and they did have an automotive section in there and the name of the column was called whip appeal so i had been working there for like two months and they quickly realized that i was the only person who knew cars let alone could like drive stick or do anything like that. So well, yeah, because it's New York, it's right? New York. And nobody and drives. It's just the culture of car. Car culture is really interesting. There is a huge scene in New York, but it's you know there's so many people living in New York that you may sit in you know a room of thirty people and not a single other person there is into cars, right? Right. So yeah, sure. because of that, uh, I kind of climbed that ladder pretty quickly. They gave me the column. I ran the column. And that actually spawned a job offer from a magazine in New York called Rides Magazine. So Rides was actually pretty big at the time. It was, you know, a spinoff of King Magazine, which if you're not sure, if you have never heard of King, it's kind of like the African-American version of Maxim at the time. And that magazine was crushing on the newsstand. And that they had a column in there called Rides, and that spun off its own magazine. Oh, and because wow. I knew hip-hop and because I knew cars, it sort of made sense. And while I was never really the like, you know, chrome 26 inch rim guy, it was still car culture. It was still something I could get into. And living in New York City, there weren't really many other options to go work in the automotive space. You know, most of those jobs were either in Detroit or, or California. So yeah, it, it started there. And I went from being an intern at Mass Appeal to an associate editor within a few months. And next thing you know, I had a job offer as a senior editor at, you know, at a, at a nationally circulated magazine. Yeah. yeah that was doing 170,000 subs and, uh, you know, and, and had this, you know, huge following and background behind it all. So yeah, it was That's sick. Yeah. That's awesome. So then you, I guess you left the Rides magazine to start Zero to 60? No, actually, uh, Harris Publications, who did uh, Rides, they did King. They also did XXL, Revolver magazine. Uh, they did a bunch of different mags. Uh, I just was pitching Zero to 60. Uh, the publishers were they, were, they were really good guys in that they really respected the creatives to kind of go and make their own stuff. I mean, there was a lot of things I hated about them, but I, looking back at it now, you know, 26 year old me wouldn't have told you that, right. but 40 year old me looks back and realizes that they really, they looked at a, at the time I was 24 years old and they put a lot of trust in me to go and pivot magazines and do different things and launch my own magazine. So I started, I mean, I, I think I was there for three months before I started saying, I got this idea, I want to do this this car magazine, I want to do this like new version of the Buff book, I want to do Car and Driver for my generation. Sure. Because I found myself gravitated to car magazines of yesteryear. Sure. And, and the British mags. But I wasn't reading 
any of the current magazines. I didn't read Motor Trend. I mean, I didn't even think of Motor Trend as a magazine. I thought of it as like the thing that held the coffee table down at the dentist office. <laughs> so for me, I just didn't really care about that mag. I didn't, I kind of liked Road and Track. Um, Car and Driver didn't feel like the magazine it was years before. And I had bought boxes of Car and Driver from the 70s and like, and read those articles. And that made me want to make a magazine like that. And that was really where a lot of the inspiration came from was between what I was reading in Evo and Car out of the UK and Top Gear, um, also some of the the Aussie mags. But then, you so know, so sorry to interrupt that. you, but yeah. how are those attributes different then? Like, what were you seeing from the '70s Car and Driver that wasn't appealing to you in the current issue? I I think that there was just this different sense of adventure in the magazines. I mean, if I was to put it on one term, like there was like an excitement to there the... was an excitement. It felt like there was a band of misfits running the magazine, you know, and that's the Brock Yates kind of era of car and driver. And it just felt like there was way more attitude. Um, they were even political at a certain element, which I just thought was great. It, it it's it had what, an edge. Yeah, it had an edge that I felt had really gotten neutered in the kind of that current era of of car and driver. And you know, I have a lot of friends who who worked over there, and you know, I think individually a lot of them have writ had written great stories. But there was certainly a mandate coming from up top that sort of changed the direction of what that magazine was. You I'm know? even thinking like just the types of cars too, because like yeah, you went I from, wonder if there's like a correlation of like. You know, from brand to brand in the 70s, they're very distinctive mm -hmm. looks from brand to brand. Whereas like you fast forward to 2000, everything is becoming a box in silver. Mm -hmm. You know, the Lexus looks like the Beamer looks like, I mean, yeah. similar. Have you, know you what seen I mean? the, there's a meme and it's every single like SUV in the market right now. And it's they're disgusting. all white. <laughs> and the Bentley SUV from a profile looks just like a Hyundai. Like it, it, there's no difference anymore. We, we've streamlined all of that. And I do. I think that that's part of it. Um, I also, and look, this is me being, you know, waxing poetic for a nostalgic era, but I think that people really respected writing in magazines in a different way in that era. So people really took it seriously. You know, I mean, now it's got, all just about yeah, photos. It's like 60s and 70s. You've got, you know, you've got the Hunter S. Thompson kind of vibe, and journalists had a different. Uh, they, they just had a different style about them and it was kind of cool to be, you know, running on the edge. And I, I think that's how people saw Brock Yates. I mean, he ran a cannonball run, which was a, a legal race across America. Yeah. A magazine did that. I mean, that's, they were so cool that they, they weren't reporting on a trend. They actually were creating the trend. Right. And I think that that was what struck me was instead of sitting there following what other people were doing, they were just going out and making it and creating it. And still to this day, One Lap of America is probably one of the best events in the United States to go participate in, which, you know, as they drive from racetrack to racetrack over the week, course of a week and go race a bunch of places. And it's this fun event that was grown out of the cannonball and grown out of what the car and driver editors and writers wanted to do. And I think that that was something uh, that just struck me as this, I, 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 help, I couldn't help but feel that, when I read Car and Driver, that they were all, they all knew each other and they all did things together and they were all part of this group. And maybe that wasn't true. And I've heard later on that a bunch of them hated each other. But it, it was the same thing for Bones Brigade for me as a skateboarder, as a kid. I wanted to believe that they all lived in the same house and they, they hung out every day. It wasn't until I was much older that I realized that, you know, half of them lived like four hours away from each other. But there was this cool band of brothers kind of vibe to what they were doing and it really resonated in the content that they were creating. Yeah, for sure. So zero to 60 kicks off, right? Um, how long did that stick around for? So zero to 60 launched in 2007 uh, and ran into the end of 2010. I actually left as editor in chief at the end of 2009 to join Ken and start Hoonigan and, kind of run and launch his race team uh mike spinelli continued on took the eic position i backed out and was like editor emeritus but i wish i was more involved in the end days but i wasn't unfortunately i feel like the magazine either came too late or too soon right, right. yeah um when i say it came too late i feel like if it had been five years earlier it would have gotten a much better 
um, run, right? The print industry was done. I mean, all gr- huge books were losing, you know, all their entire staff. I mean, you had, you know, magazines like FHM and stuff and all these things that were, were doing massive numbers on the newsstand a year later were gone. You know, the 2008 recession hits, the print industry gets smashed, the internet's booming, a whole new way of marketing and advertising. So I think in some ways, you know, if Zero Sixty maybe had came a year earlier, I think it would have had a completely different life. Um, but I also look at what magazines are today, and the ones that are successful are taking the format we created for Zero to Sixty was don't focus on new cars because you can't beat the internet and timeliness. Focus on adventure. Focus on premium paper. Focus on uh, an experience. Focus on great photography. Um, and you're seeing that now with things like Triple Zero and Type Seven and Road Rat and all that. And like that's the book I really wanted to make, but we kind of were stuck in the middle because we had to make something that was commercially viable to an advertiser, but you know, and something that could still sell on the newsstand. You know, and the fight for paper was a huge fight I had with the publisher. I mean, the magazine did four uh, issues, and immediately the publisher was like, "Well, we need to save some money, so let's cut the paper." And I actually like the weight of it, the weight of the paper, yeah, yeah, yeah. how nice the paper is. Yeah. And to me, I felt like what made zero to 60, what it was, was that it didn't feel disposable. Right. It was but, tactile. Like the, the tactile aspect of it was substantial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you think at that era, you look at some of the leading magazines at the time, people magazine was like a million plus in Cirque an issue. And they're coming out multiple times a month. Right. So, but that magazine was disposable. My mom, my mom would read it, and then it would be, you know, in the bathroom, you know, garbage can at the end of the week, right? Where I wanted to make something that you wanted to hold, you wanted to keep, you know, you wanted it on your wall. And I still hear from, you know, I hear from viewers of Hoonigan all the time. Like I still have all my zero to sixty mags, and that makes me so happy because that's what we intended to make. We wanted to make something that felt more like a book and less like a disposable rag, you know, yeah. which is what the magazine industry had moved to at that point. And I think that now you're, you know, you're seeing these guys coming out doing annuals, doing things that, you know, are quarterlies that they're not about advertising and you have an audience that's willing to pay a premium price point for an issue. And that allows them to create, you know, a better book because people want to have that. And I, I in a lot of ways, I think Zero Sixty came out in this weird in between where we were getting rid of the disposable rag, but we hadn't rolled out the new book. So I don't know. One day maybe I'll relaunch it and do something different with it. Yeah, that's cool. So you mentioned Ken Block, obviously, um, or not by name. You said Ken. Mm-hmm. But I knew who you were talking about. So Ken Block's introduction came when? Like, how did that relationship start? So I met Ken while on assignment for an article I was doing for Rides magazine. Okay, so, so before. Zero yeah, Sixty. so it was around the same time. Um, Ken was actually very instrumental in us getting Zero to Sixty to launch because, well, I'll back up and I'll, I'll dig into that. But I met him on assignment. We were doing a story on the Gumball 3000 uh, rally and... I had contact with DC Shoe Company through their PR department. And actually, I heard that Rob Deerdick was going to be on the event. And I thought, oh, that's a great article for us to run, front of the book, small story uh, for rides. I reached out to DC and they said, uh, hey, actually, you know, they're like, yeah, we can potentially provide you with, you know, some information on that after the event. And then they called me back and they said, hey, we just spoke to our. Uh, I don't remember if he was the president at the time or chief brand officer. So we just spoke to, you know, Ken Block and I didn't know who Ken was at the time. And he said, he said, uh, he said that if you, if you can be in London by tomorrow, uh, he has extra space in his car. If you want to ride along on the gumball rally. Oh, that's so, you know, and at the time the gumball was this crazy thing. And, uh, I think it has taken a couple different paths since then, but at the time everyone wanted to be a part of gumball. So I Went, I convinced my publisher, I bought a ticket for 700 bucks, which was the cheapest ticket I could find. It was like middle seat, back of the plane. I packed a backpack and that was it. And, and you're six foot. I'm six foot eight. Yeah. yeah. So back of the plane. Yeah, it was middle tough. seat. Well, it gets worse, which is <laughs> I land in Trafalgar Square. I land, I meet Ken in Trafalgar Square only to get into the back of a Subaru STI and ride in the back seat for a couple of days, which was also not really uh, the best place to fit. Although... We were like halfway into it and he gave me the wheel, let me drive for a bunch. But um, oh, it was, yeah, and I met him and we just really gelled and we started talking about stuff. And while Ken at the time 
didn't really know the automotive space that well. He had already kind of proven to, you know, be pretty successful as a driver in like national level rally racing. And, you know, he wanted to do more. But the thing that we really connected on was we both really loved kind of marketing and messaging and storytelling and wanting to do bigger kind of crazier ideas. And, you know, that, that synergy came together. And as I said, he really helped and was instrumental in making zero to 60 happen um, because he loved the idea of what zero to 60 was. And he actually committed an ad from DC shoes in the, uh, in the premiere issue. And that was like enough to get my publishers to think, wow, maybe this will actually go somewhere. Cause at that point DC wasn't advertising in any of the other magazines. So it was like a new partner for them. And then after that, uh, another, another person I knew, uh, Oscar Parada over at Michelin committed an ad for Michelin. And that was enough for them That's to huge, go, yeah. wow, we've got one of the top tire companies. And then we've got one of, you know, we've got a clothing company that's like, you know, at, in kind of non endemic to us. And then next thing, you know, Pirelli committed a, an ad spread and, and that's sort of how that grew. And yeah, so I mean, he was, he was very much involved in zero 60, which is funny because in the end he took me away from it, but, uh, right. But yeah. No, we, we were just trying to do something different at the time, and Ken even had a column in Zero to Sixty. Um, oh, which, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I forget what it was called. It was, I don't remember anything. It wasn't anything lengthy. No, it was just like was, a one yeah, page, yeah, a two page like in the a, front. Yeah. And it was just kind of like following the crazy antics of Ken, because at that point, Ken was very much in the, let's make a spectacle, like, let's go jump you know, uh, a massive tabletop jump at a snowboard park. Let's go do, you know, he did the stunt junkies jump where he jumped 171 feet and set a record for rally car jumps. And, you know, he was doing all this stuff at the time and, you know, there wasn't really anyone else who was paying attention to it. So yeah. we saw that and we just thought it was super cool and super different. And in a way, Ken embodied everything that Zero to 60 magazine wanted driving to be, which was like just going out and having fun. And then eventually... You know, we did a story on the sport of Gymkhana and that kind of spawned Spawned into, yeah, the Gymkhana practice video, which then created this whole thing, you know. That's insane. So so. Hoonigan started as his race moniker? Um, No, so Hoonigan was all, there was always the idea that Hoonigan would be this brand that sort of operated, um, you know, behind Ken. The the background for Hoonigan was that, Ken looked when Ken got into racing, right? So realize Ken starts racing. He's 36 years old. Um, when I meet him, I'm 25, right? So we're, you know, he's looking at it coming from skateboarding, coming from snowboarding, motocross, right? Where those sports have not just a spectacle, but they have a cult behind them. Sure. Right? And he comes into the world of motorsports. He comes into automotive, and he feels like that's kind of lacking, right? Like there's no brand that really identifies a certain type of participant in the motorsports world, right? right. You've got like a click almost. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Just kind of like you have your Porsche guy. Right. You've got your Beamer guy. Right. But there was nothing like from an apparel standpoint, like right. You knew like the them. guys that rode for Forum. You know, there yeah. were like four star distribution right. exactly. and four square. Exactly. And, all that and jazz. Even, and even that, like you think about it, like, you know, you look at brands like like a Volcom or stuff like that. Like 100%. They, they weren't even a hard good brand. They just had an attitude or style. Or if you go into motocross, Metal Militia, like they didn't make bikes. They didn't make safety gear. But they were like the badasses in that space. And if you wore it, it kind of identified you. And that's what, you know, we started talking about this, that there wasn't this brand that really identified an audience, right? Um, there was small things. Like when I was a kid, if you wore, you know, a Max Power t-shirt, which was, a, you know, the UK mag, that kind of identified like what you were. Um, maybe if you had like a Nopi shirt on, you were into import or something like that. But it still wasn't really this perfect definer. And, you know, I always relate it back to this. Like my first day of college, I picked out the shirt and the hat I was going to wear. Like I wore a ride snowboard hat and then like, I think an operation Ivy t-shirt because like I wanted to wave this flag that I was like the snowboard kid who was into punk rock. And within an hour I met someone who then ended up not only being my roommate, but like a lifelong friend of mine because he was also into snowboarding and punk rock. You know, we just, I just wanted to like wave that flag that like I belong to this. And 
that's what we wanted really Hoonigan to be. Like if you walk into a bar or you walk into your, you know, first calculus 101 class and you look uh, and you see someone wearing a Hoonigan shirt, you know that you probably have something in common with that person. For sure. And it was really kind of taking something that already existed. There was already this cult of kids who enjoyed cars but they didn't want to be the tommy bahama wearing like (laughs) you know version of the car show guy like their dad was you know they wanted to do something different and they wanted to have a different attitude to it and whether that was doing burnouts or sliding cars around or just building badass cars they it it already existed and we really just kind of gave them a name you know and i think that's why you saw you know, within two months of launching the brand, we had kids tattooing themselves. And like, that's when you know you're onto something because you're like, whoa, you're making a lifelong decision on that. Like, I don't even know if we'll be involved with that for that long. And it just started to grow. And I, I remember there was this comment, I don't know, about three years in, where someone said, even if Hoonigan goes out of business, like, I'll still be a Hoonigan. And that was this moment where you realize the brand had transcended the company. It supersedes everything. Yeah. Right? At that point. That's a culture. Yeah. That becomes a culture, you know, and, and, and I think you see that in, you know, the people who are part of our content or wear the clothing or have the sticker on their car, you know, it, it's, it's an identifier for them of, of doing something different. So who owns it? Uh, so Ken and I co-founded it. Um, we're owners and we also have a partner, uh, as well in Wasserman media group, which has been Ken's agent and everything. So yeah, so they're kind of in the background help us with a lot of the business and that type of stuff. So you guys have grown obviously into like a media company Mm -hmm. and an apparel company and all that stuff. Was that like, what was the original ethos other than creating this culture and this brand to represent this Culture, yeah. I guess, for the lack of a better description. Well, look. I, was there any, would, like, business I, plan, obviously? Yeah, there was. Like- there's actually, uh, there's something on the wall of uh, one of the other offices that came out of the 2011 brand book. And realize we launched the brand in 2011, right? So, um, and in everything on the trajectory of what we wanted to do, we've done, right? That's insane. But, but I wouldn't say that we had the greatest roadmap of how to get there. I will say this is when we started the company, we said it's we're never going to call it an apparel company because we I, I personally didn't really want to be limited to apparel only. I wasn't an apparel guy. Uh, Ken was the apparel guy. Uh, apparel was a really good way to start a brand and be in a position where you could actually promote your brand and have other people pay you to do that, right? So people buy t-shirts, right. they see your logo, your logo gets out there. So it, it really worked well. And you know, it's a, apparel's generally a low risk industry to get into, right? The product doesn't cost that much um, to hold. Uh, it's, you know, it's not like you're making car parts. Car parts is a much more expensive space. Yeah, to like in into. machining like parts. Machining and, and yeah. engineering and all of that. Like, yeah, you get into fits and things like that, but you can start out pretty easily in the apparel business. Um, and, you know, like I said, it was a good way to promote. So we knew that was a starter, but we never wanted to be known as a clothing brand. We always wanted to be just kind of known as like this automotive lifestyle brand. And from there, uh, the media side of the business came out of that we had to promote our own brand. And this is this really interesting time, right? Like the idea for Hoonigan starts in 2010. We, we tease it in 2010. 2011, we officially launched the brand. You know, so you look in 2011, Facebook has just allowed brand pages. Instagram hasn't even started yet. Um, YouTube is, is trying to find itself, right? The vlog format hasn't really happened yet. Everyone's still trying to swing for these big 20, 30 million viral view videos. Um, you know, so we're there kind of early on and I come from the print, you know, industry. I knew how flawed the advertising world was in print and it wasn't working. And then at the same time, there wasn't anything else out there. Like the forums were shifting, everything was changing. So we decided we're not going to spend a single cent on advertising Hoonigan. So we never ran a single advertisement. We never ran a banner ad. We never ran any of that. Some of it happened because of trade outs with guys or friends would say, Hey, I'll run a banner ad, but we never paid for any exposure ever for, for Hoonigan that wasn't through our own owned and operated, you know, social media. That was it. We're like, let's just start kind of promoting this on our own and, and really, you know, get after that. And we saw it as a new opportunity because we looked at as, you know, Ken had this kind of great marketing background and I had this 
a really narrative storytelling background from content. So we knew how to make stuff that people wanted to see and wanted to digest. And that became the game. And we started, you know, it was, it was making small videos. It was making just disposable content every day that people were enjoying, uh, you know, on Facebook and then eventually on Instagram. Um, you know, and that started with really being photo heavy just because the limitations on the technical side. And then as video became an easier consumable, then we got more into the video stuff and that continued to grow. And uh, around 2017, we start to notice that you know, at this point, the brand's been around for six years. Well, and you're on Jim Connor what at that well, at this point? point at Seventeen. When did yeah, that launch? I mean, it, um, we'll figure. We did in 2010. We did Jim Connor three, right? So, do the quick math from there. So yeah, ten. I mean, yeah. Uh, well, seventeen. Technically, ten came out in eighteen, right? Okay. So yeah, because we skipped a year. Clem Connor came out in seventeen, so okay. that year went off. So, but you know, at this point, we're looking at it from from the Hoonigan side, and you know. And speaking of the Gymkhana thing, Gymkhana was always, it was a success from the first video that got uploaded. Oh, 100%. Right? I mean, we uploaded that video actually to Ken's website because this is kind of pre, YouTube's around, but it's not on the level of what people know it as today. And Ken gets a phone call from his broadband supplier a month later and says, yeah, you got, you owe us $28,000 in broadband fees. And Ken's like, what? It's like, yeah, you have had over 10 million pings to the website in the past month. When we made that video, views were not a metric. It wasn't something that we had thought about. We made the video because we wanted other people to talk about it. So we made the video so that Jalopnik, Autoblog, Road and Tracks Blog, Car and Driver, you know, Top Gear, they would talk about it. We weren't really thinking like about views. That wasn't something that we had even thought about because obviously it's living on you know this embedded player on his site that's you know that had no view counter and ken called me and said hey do you think zero to 60 would want to have this on their channel instead and i talked to the publisher and the publisher's like we can't afford you know thirty thousand dollars a month in views if it continues to grow like that and we don't have any advertising attached to it so no and i called ken back and i said hey there's this crazy thing uh called youtube and apparently you don't have to pay them to put videos there <laughs> which is so funny because now we get mad that youtube doesn't pay us enough for our videos to be there but <laughs> um so yeah then and then you know and the rest was history and then that video went on to go do like another 10 plus million views on on youtube uh pretty quickly are you a watch collector but having trouble finding something cool and unique i mean the last thing you really want is what everyone else has right well, this is where my friend and former Standard Age podcast guest Tim Jackson comes in. He and his wife Jana own Passion Fine Jewelry in Solana Beach, California, where you'll find an incredible assortment of independent watches waiting for you in their shop and online. And if you're getting engaged, have an anniversary coming up, or simply have another reason to buy jewelry, they have you covered. Passion Fine Jewelry also employs a goldsmith on staff for any custom desires, so you're able to go that route if you so choose. Visit Passion Fine Jewelry when you find yourself in Southern California, but they're also open 24 hours a day at passionfinejewelry.com. You can also find a wealth of information through Tim's blog, independentintime.com, where he covers anything independent watchmaking related, uh, among a plethora of other information. So check that out as well. I've really enjoyed creating these podcasts on behalf of Standard H and sharing each of these personal stories with all of you. We each have goals, and it's the entrepreneurial spirit that inspired me to start the company. You can further support the brand and the podcast by visiting standard-h.com to pick up your choice of merchandise. And as always, thank you for listening. Lastly, if you have a moment, please rate and review the show. It makes a tremendous difference in keeping these things going. Now back to my conversation with Brian. Yeah, so at, at this point, we know that the... Gymkhana thing works, but Gymkhana is a big project and it takes a lot of resources. It takes a lot of money to make and it, it's not easy. I mean, it's a proper size commercial. Right? What's what's the cheapest Gymkhana that you guys have done? Just so people can the understand. First one? Yeah. All right. Well, maybe like, <laughs> that's like, you know, you could like give me a value, an estimate. Like how much does one cost? A lot. Um, They started. I mean, they are, you know, they're definitely a, a seven figure 
position now. So Sick. they weren't in the beginning, but they've grown. And they've grown to be that just because everything just gets more and more expensive and it was easier to make them, you know, cheaper in the beginning and well yeah because like to make them different you got the wow factor right so yeah you yeah step you, up just, that you, game. you raise your own bar and you keep having higher expectation levels of what you want to do i mean the first one was filmed you know at el toro air base or which is an abandoned air base that they don't really use and you know i think it cost them like nothing to rent it every day and then the fifth one we shut down san francisco i was gonna say the fifth so, one was like the it's, monumental it's one still that the best I remember. One. Yeah. It's still the best one. I mean, San Francisco was just this amazing, unique. It was a unique time in the internet. Uh, it was a unique time for us because it was the first time we'd ever shut down a city. Uh, the whole time we were there, I was pinching myself thinking, the cops are going to shut us down. Like, there's no way that the minute, the minute they see the car moving, they're going to say, no, you can't do this. Like, we could not believe we were being allowed to do what we were Cause doing. Because you guys shut down the Bay Bridge. Yeah, we shut down the Bay Bridge. We shut down, like, some of the major streets there, Vallejo, a bunch of things. I mean, it now, was... Now, were you filming, like, early Sunday morning? Yeah, so there's the Bay like, Bridge yeah. was... We started at 6.30 in the morning. Um, we only had it shut down for eight minutes at a time. Um, it took us two takes to get that shot. Uh, yeah, but it was still... But it, it, we shut down for eight minutes... And I want to say that we backed traffic up 21 miles into the previous county to do that one shot. Just making enemies. Yeah, just make, yeah. <laughs> so um, we haven't been back for for reasons. But no, um, it's yeah, it was it was great. But you know, back to what I was saying, we got to this point where we started to realize that the most valuable thing we had as a company was audience, right? So. And that's really the business. If you ask me, like, what's the business of Hoonigan right now? It's like the business is audience. And that's so do you consider yourself more of a media company now? I guess so. But at the same time, we do events as well. And we still have a product business um, sure. that's that's really healthy and growing. And, and you know, we sort of created our own little universe that kind of serves itself, right? We've got uh, – we have an audience that watches the media – and then they buy the product and the product obviously helps fund back the media as well as any kind of branded or sponsorship deals we have. Uh, and then those people also want to go to the events, but then the events also are things that bring in a new audience that now wants to buy product or uh, wants to watch our content. So, I mean, I, I think that what we've created is entry points, you know, someone may be, you know, walking down the street and they see someone wearing a Hoonigan shirt and we hear this all the time. People ask, what is Hoonigan? Yeah. What is, that you know, mean? now, now they're interested and they'll go home and they'll search Hoonigan and they'll land on one of our YouTube shows. They watch our YouTube show and now they think it's pretty cool. They start watching it more. And then next thing you know, they show up at one of our events and like, so they all sort of feed each other. You know, there's, there's business turns for creating that kind of cycle, but you know, we we it wasn't done as a business strategy it was really done because that's how the community just you know, automotive works it yeah. just it's how that is and you know one of my favorite things to read is and i it's happened so much so much that it's not a single moment or like you know this this one kind of uh uh example it's i get i get comments which are Hey, I just want to thank you. Hoonigan got me into cars. A, one of my classmates was wearing a Hoonigan shirt. I didn't know what it was, so I went and looked it up. And then I started watching, you know, your guys' daily transmission series. And I just bought my first project car. And, like, that's so cool to me that something that we built can get, you know, a young kid into the automotive space. Because as a kid from New York City, if it wasn't for my grandfather, I wouldn't have been into cars. He was into cars, and that's why I liked cars as a kid, and I kept with that. But most of my friends weren't. I mean, most of the guys that I went to high school with or grew up in my neighborhood, I mean, they thought cars were cool just as much as the next guy does because it's something, you know, you like football, you like cars, it's very masculine. But they weren't, like, wrenching on cars on the weekend or they didn't, you know, their dad didn't teach them how to tune a carburetor. It wasn't anything like that. So sure. um, I, I think that right now that's something that's really interesting for us and it's something I'm super proud of that we can be this – you know, entry point or this conduit for a younger generation to look at cars and they come in because it's entertainment at first and then they get the car side of it. Like every episode we make, I always say it needs to be entertaining and it also needs to be educational. Like that's because then they want to watch it and then they walk away with some knowledge that, you know, helps them get more into it or dive deeper into it. Yeah, for sure. How many employees are you guys up to now? Um, if you would have asked me that, uh, 
three years ago, it would have been really easy because I think it was seven. I think we're at 40 plus now. So what so happened in like three 40 years? 42. Uh, it was really daily content on YouTube really kind of changed the business for us. Um, it, you know, it reached, it took the brand from being this thing that was sort of this thing in the background or this thing that you only connected with some of our sponsored drivers, um, Kent Block back in the day, guys like Ryan Turk, Chris Forsberg, um, and, and all of that was great and it really helped kind of set the stage for us, but this sort of you know and it goes back to that car and driver thing this like band of misfits this this group of guys is really what the hoonigan staff has become so i mean most of our on-screen talent are guys who work in the building i mean they all have other jobs it's one of the things that a lot of people on youtube don't understand like oh why why hasn't this guy worked on his car or why hasn't he gotten this done or where's he been because like, he's got a he's job. got a full-time <laughs> job he's putting 10 hours in as an editor or a biz dev guy or you know he's working over this side of things so yeah i mean that was a lot of what it was was just hiring real car guys and you know and it, it just created this different vibe and i i think when you look at it you look at someone like Ken, and Ken is this super, super aspirational figure. 99.999% of us will never be Ken, right? One, we won't have the ability to do what he's done, whether that's skill or financially. Um, and Ken's kind of an enigma. There hasn't really been another Ken. And I'm not just saying that because I'm, you know, I'm sort of the guy behind the guy with Ken, but we've tried it and tried to get other people to be on that level and it's difficult i mean i think the closest you have to ken in the space is like a travis pastrana you i was know? gonna say like rob dyrdek on a certain but level. dyrdek's not a car guy you oh know that's what I'm saying? true like, that's I mean, true yeah 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 let me that's take true. that back because if dyrdek hears this he'll blow me up on time <laughs> dyrdek's a car guy but he's not primarily a car guy he's got some great ferraris and he likes cars but that's not his space you know i what see I'm what saying? you're saying yeah like as a i mean more as like a race car driver right you know like gotcha. in that space Lewis Hamilton, I think, is doing a really good job of getting himself out there beyond just motorsports. Um, but I think most race car drivers very much depend on their uh, racing series to be their megaphone, where Ken was like, I'm just going to build a brand around myself. Um, so anyway, I think that you look at that, and that's a super aspirational side. But then you look at guys in the building like Hurt or Vinny um, or Ron, like any of these guys, and you you're like them. You know, so that type of content connected with a different audience because they make mistakes. They're not the best drivers. They're not the best mechanics, but that's okay because you can look at those guys and say, I, I, I'm just like them. And, and they are, you know, I, I get this all the time. I'll meet kids at the airport and they'll, you know, they'll come up to me and it's weird because they act a little like starstruck and I, I'm not used to that. Like, I'm just this guy who's just making some stuff I, I don't really see myself in any kind of level like that but like oh scotto 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 and then i'll just start talking to him and they think that the conversation's over they're like okay well thanks for the autograph and i'm like yeah so where, where are you going like what are you doing and then we'll start <laughs> you're like talking. but wait i want to talk <laughs> yeah and they'll be like oh man like you're just like a normal person it's like yeah we're all just normal people <laughs> like that's just how it i mean shit at the end of the day ken's a normal person too but you know i think that we're all car guys so we're all really interested you know i've definitely have i've pulled people over driving a cool car start talking to them and then all of a sudden they'll be like wait aren't you brian from the hoonigans and i'm like yeah 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 and they're like oh dude oh it's so cool i'm like yeah anyway so back to this how do you have this how do you have this turbo plumb like you know because the worst that and i think that that's what the youtube stuff really did for us was help connect the brand on a really relatable level where you realize that the guys behind the brand are, you know, they're, they're just like the people watching the show. And a lot of the people who actually have watched the show now work here. We had a guy show up on our door. Uh, one of our new editors, he said, I just want to work here. Like, I want to work here. We're like, well, what, what can you do? He's like, oh, I could, you know, I, I could do this. I could do this. I could do this. And he's been working here for six months now. That's like we, awesome. Yeah. You know, and I, that's very much just kind of the brand we are. That's cool. Okay, so you mentioned the business plan hanging on the wall. Has anything deviated from that original vision? No, I think the way we got there maybe took a little bit of a different order, right? So I, if you, I got a picture it in my head, but you know, there's obviously the apparel business. We knew that. The other piece of it said, you know, uh, a, a full media house. I think it's. I think that was the actual term. It was like a, you know, a media house, like soup to nuts, like yeah. Because I looked at, I looked at. Uh, Red Bull and I was always really impressed by what Red Bull had become. Absolutely. I mean, Red Bull 
apparently they make a drink, but like <laughs> they're also this amazing marketing company, right? And for sure, a, an incredible branding company, uh, and also a great media company. I mean, they've made some great pieces of media, whether it's Art of Flight or some of the content that you just see all the time. And they were also a fantastic event company. I mean, you look at things like, um, what's it called crashed ice or whatever like the you know downhill ice hockey racing i mean they they create these things that are just new and exciting um and i you know very much looked at that playbook and said like this is what a brand should be i mean and that's where red bull is very much a brand where other companies don't have that kind of connection you know i i don't i mean even if you compare it to the biggest beverage in the world Coca-Cola has something really unique because Coca-Cola has this nostalgia. There's this Americana in Coca-Cola, but I still think of Coca-Cola as like a beverage. And I, and that's I, true. Yeah. Right. Like we're Red Bull. It's like when I think when you say Red Bull, the first thing that comes to my mind may not be the beverage. It may be, you know, their formula one team. It might be their guys like, you know, guys like Travis Pastrana, who I, I see when I think about Red Bull or, just the logo or events that they've done or, you know, the helmet, you know, like the, it, they've, they really understood branding. Um, so I think for Hoonigan, you know, in that same manner, when we set out, it was like, Hey, we want to do media, but we also want to do, um, events because we think events are important but we also want to be like smart in the way that we license and do things with the brand so some of our partnerships like our partnership with microsoft forza like you can download 10 hoonigan cars in that game that's great why because i've got young kids who are 13 years old who can't drive a car who are getting to drive my 911 getting to drive hertz twerk stallion getting to drive ken's unicorn that are beginning to connect with the brand before maybe they are of the right age to or whatever and you know we've done we're doing a i'm probably I'm probably blowing a NDA here, but we're doing uh, you know, some Hoonigan cars with Hot Wheels coming up, and it's oh, like, sick. you know, and that's cool for me because Hot Wheels is was the first car I ever that's, had. Yeah, you know, you asked say. me before, what was my first yeah. car? <laughs> my first car was actually a Hot Wheels, you know, and and that's cool. That's a way to get to that brand and get to, I mean, get the brand to a younger audience. And you know, look, obviously, there, there's the business side of this where you you want your brand in front of people at a young age and they get to be a part of it. But there's also this other part of it where, for me. I really, I want the hobby of automotive and the hobby of motorsport to continue, you know, and there's a lot of things I think that threaten that and you need big, strong brands that have uh, the ability and the power to adjust that and to change that and to get other people behind it. Uh, I'm not going to tangent a little bit, but this morning I read an article that you're that in the county of Sacramento, you're no longer allowed to work on your car in the gar in your own garage. Right. And this is like one of those weird laws. So the background on it, I think, is there's an environmental element to it. It very much feels like an HOA type thing. And I get it with HOAs. Like if you buy a house in an HOA and the HOA doesn't want you working on your car, like that's what the community decided. You probably shouldn't have bought a house in that HOA. I purposely bought a house that was not in an HOA for that one reason. But the fact that this ent that an entire county is trying to prevent people from working on cars, like it's because they're looking at it through a single lens. And the lens they're looking at it through is like, oh, well, if someone works on their car, they may spill coolant. That's bad for the environment. Like th that's the argument that, that I read real quickly. But they miss all those other parts that like how good of a hobby the automotive culture can be for people. I mean, I, I can tell you a thousand stories, myself included, where if I didn't have cars, my life would have gone a much different direction. That would not have been as a value. I would not be as valuable a member of society as I am today if I didn't have cars. Like uh, most of my friends, were, you know, got into a bunch of shit, went to jail, dead. I mean, it's it's a standard like growing up in an inner city thing that happens. But then you look at kids who get into cars and have this hobby and this passion around it and working on that stuff. And it teaches you a skill set like it teaches you how to think through things. And look, I went to college, but I probably learned more in a garage than I learned in college about life and about working with people and about thinking through problems and all of that. So I'm tangenting there a bit. I know and I do that a lot. But I think that, you know, it's one of the things for Hoonigan, um, you know, yeah, sure, we're a business, but we also want to defend our 
our hobby, defend our sport and, you know, and remind people that there is still this younger generation that cares about it. And in 20 years from now, we might all be working on electric cars, but that's fine. It's still the hobby, like hot rodding cars with Tesla engines right now. They're fast. I'm not going to, I'm not going <laughs> to deny that, but it's still this cool pursuit for speed or, or whatever it is. If you enjoy crawling over rocks or you just like making a car look cool and shiny, like that's just, it's great, man. It's part of the culture. It's brought me so much happiness in my life, you know, and it's, it's just a bummer to see that we're, we are at a point where I think we have to defend it more because people think people don't see the value in it. They don't see, you know, what being around car culture can bring for certain people. I mean, look for you and I, it's been our careers. Yeah. Yeah. You know, exactly. So. Would you have done anything differently with the brand? Um, no, you know, you make a lot of mistakes and you go certain directions, but if you didn't go that direction, you wouldn't have figured it out. Um, we're current, we're currently in a major kind of direction change with our daily content, kind of just getting back to the core of what we wanted to do. Um, and really making what we want to make versus making what, you know, we think is going to do well or what the advertisers want or whatever. But we had to go the other direction to kind of feel that out and see what works. You know, at the end of the day, it's still a business. You still got to still got to make payroll. You know, you got to try different things and figure different things out. Um, I, I think a lot of times I wish I had done things faster. You know, like the the content idea we wanted to do in 2012. We just didn't really roll. When I say content, I mean the everyday kind of YouTube daily exposure content we had a plan to do it in 2012. There's actually shows that have happened where the original treatment for them were written in 2012. Um, we wanted to be more in that space then, but we didn't really have the capital to be. Um, we, it wasn't, a, a it wasn't a function of what the company was at that point, And we didn't really know what the ROI was, but yeah, shit. I, I wish that Hoonigan got on YouTube in a everyday format. I mean, we were on YouTube, since the beginning with Jumkana, but in an everyday format, I wish we got into it three or four years earlier. I think we would like be, a daily vlog type situation. Yeah. I mean, which is what, you know, which is what we rolled out in 2017. Um, you know, we grew super fast. I mean, we went, we, we caught and passed a lot of people out there and we've got, you know, 3 million plus subs on our, on our one channel, but then we have an additional like 1.5 million subs on, you know, other channels we've grown. We've built other channels to be more specific to different pieces of the audience, whether it's build content or whatever. Um, but I just wish we were there a bit earlier because it's all been really good since we got there, Yeah, you know, and we, we had a couple struggles and trying to figure things out and, and doing different things and working out different ways to promote and, and work the company. Um, and I, I just, yeah, if we could have gotten to that sooner, great, but we're still here and you know, it's one of those things where everything works out for a certain reason. Yeah. hundred percent. So just real quick, what are the two channels so people can check it out? Um, well, actually I think we have like five channels now. So okay. it's, it's, <laughs> it's Hoonigan, uh, the red, regular Hoonigan channel, which is just, uh, youtube.com slash Hoonigan, which is the Hoonigan main channel. Then we have Hoonigan, project car channel which is where we've put all of our build content uh and that was because we realized that the viewer that wanted to watch guys work on cars didn't maybe want to watch the adventure stuff didn't want to watch the burnout stuff main channel has become kind of where we put quote unquote our more premium stuff so uh you know we travel down to baja and we do a you know multi-day story on that um or you know it's it's kind of more focused on a little bit more premium. We do a deep review into a car or things like that. Then we have another channel uh, called Daily Transmission, which is actually based off our original vlog. Oddly, it only comes out once a week now, but that's really just like burnouts and donuts and all that type of stuff. And that's all filmed now at Irwindale at the Burn Yard, which is our kind of space over there. I'm assuming you, you have a tire sponsor for that. Um, well, <laughs> he, did we work with a lot of different tire companies? So, I mean, we work with Falcon, Toyo Tires, BFG. We work with a bunch of different people in different capacities for different stuff. But um, yeah, that's uh, that show for us is kind of the OG show that came out of here, which we filmed in our parking lot. So we used to, it started as by just people come by, they would do burnouts. We talk about their cars. It was like, it was like Jay Leno for, a, for a younger for generation. burnouts. Yeah. For burnouts. <laughs> right. Uh, and that was the original show that really kicked everything off on YouTube. 
we after two years of that long beach finally shut us down from doing burnouts here so we had to move that to irwindale because it's no longer in the building it's hard to shoot every day so it's kind of once or twice a day um actually the guys right now are filming one today with uh son of a digger which is grave diggers son's monster truck which is going to be insane so i'm after this interview i'm going to head over and check that out but yeah we uh then we've also have bonus channel which is like it's just where the random stuff goes it doesn't have a home we'll, we'll throw it there uh and then there's two other channels that are actually really kind of single focus uh we have ken block's channel which we launched last year uh ken was kind of watching us have all this fun and creating all the youtube content and was watching it all do well and i said i, I think we should do a channel just for you so we did the ken block channel that's been great it's just once a week but it's such different types of content some of it's ken going racing others could be ken going mountain biking it's uh and then some of it's like you know today's episode is ken's you know a tour of ken's facility ken has this fantastic facility up in park city built out of containers that um you know i helped him work and design a few years back then um we have another channel called autofocus which is really a photography meets cars channel right now uh it's being ran by larry chen um who you know is kind of i think he's probably one of the most popular photographers in the automotive space today you know originally from speed hunters uh but now kind of shoots for everyone and anything uh that's really his channel and in many ways most of the he's creating all the content on it right now and it's kind of just a behind the scenes of all the cars she's shooting i mean larry will shoot you know 10 different feature cars you know in a week's time so we looked at that had a conversation with larry and said this is a great piece of content just for that so yeah and they've all sort of kind of grown out of it and you know we started by making four pieces of content a week when we when we first did the youtube thing and now we're making 14 to 15 pieces of content a week wow. if not if not more um you know and and growing beyond that you know we've been in you know we obviously did the amazon prime show uh the gymkhana files and we've been talking with uh you know a couple other otts i i can't name but you know you could picture them they make other shows that everyone watches um so yeah we've been you know working on that and we really enjoy the content game. It's a lot of fun. Um, the event game is also something that's, you know, been the Burnyard shows that we've been doing are great. And we've been doing them at Irwindale. Uh, and we want to take those on the road and expand those, make those bigger. So, yeah, it's it's been crazy. That's cool. In short, what do you see as next for you guys? Um, we, We're definitely double downing on the content thing. I mean, that's just it's a great way to just connect with an audience. Um you know, we've, uh, when is this going to air? <laughs> when do you want it to air? Uh, well, I just, it depends on what I can talk about. <laughs> no, I mean, well, um, I mean, your, your secret is safe with me. Yeah, yeah. So, so like it, it, we could do two weeks from now. So we I could think, do a month from now. Yeah. So I think that, um, I, I'll, I'll talk about this and you can just touch base with me on it. So, sure. um, just as a quick disclaimer, this conversation was recorded back in February, and due to COVID-19, the following has been delayed. So be sure to check with Hoonigans, as well as Brian's social media and YouTube channels for updates. One of the big uh, new things that we have coming up is, uh, is, is really connecting our audience with the another piece of the puzzle, right? So we've developed this kind of universe in many ways right so we have content and the guys watch our content they come to our events um every day they live through our social media and they're watching all of that uh they wear our apparel um but the reality is is most of our guys are car guys and they want to spend most of their money on car parts so we're looking a lot more into kind of the car part end of the business um but in two ways one in getting involved and in actually making some of our own stuff we've already kind of dabbled in it with collabs we've done gauges with autometer we've done um you know oil caps with mishimoto we just did a handbrake with chase bays which is a fantastic piece of engineering um we've done we did a steering wheel with momo that sold out in you know an hour and a half you know so we, we've we've started to dabble there but the other part of it too is we looking at what you know the the market has changed so much when i was a kid i would go to my local speed shop 
to buy parts, right? And my local speed shop, there were people there that I trusted. So whether that was going to like an SK Speed in Long Island or Eastern Auto Sports in Queens um, or my friend's shop Pro Works up in Vermont, you know, I went there because not only did they have the parts or they could order the parts for me, but they had people there who were knowledgeable and they also had people that I kind of looked up to because they had cool, fast cars, so I trusted them. Um, and that has really vanished, right? Like the mom and pop style shop has vanished. And now you've got kind of, everyone just buys their parts online. And, you know, it's all about kind of chasing the best price. Uh, and that's really where everyone's at. But there's not as much kind of, there, there's not as much of that local speed shop knowledge and everything that goes into it. So we're working right now on a concept, um, which we're calling Carcane Supply. And, uh, it is basically your local speed shop available to you on the internet. And it's, it's basically, if you like us and you like the stuff that we do, you're going to have, find a pretty good curated experience on buying parts, right? So it's part, it's partners and people that we do business with and that we've already used their stuff so we can speak to it and, you know, and kind of connecting that. So if you, you know, you, you look at how different the spaces like, 10 years ago, if you had a Mustang, you most likely had an engine in it that was a Ford. But today, there's a good chance you're going to have a Toyota 2JZ in it instead. Well, that means that like you have to like go shopping for parts from like three different places where we know that that's what our audience is buying. So we know that there's this blend of stuff. We know that like a lot of guys who are driving 240s have 1Js or LSs in it. You know? I was going to so, say there's like the LS swaps. Yeah, so it's like you have this crossover world that's really changed, and I don't think that the modern-day speed shop has really shifted. Some have, and there are like really specific ones. So – We've just we've been working on this idea of, you know, being more in the parts business of, you know, helping kind of curate those that side of the business um, and provide support and provide sales, you know, and, and kind of tech on things that we know our audience wants to see, you know, and, and just kind of making that a little bit better. So that's a an interesting part of it for us, um, you know, and growing more into that. And then, you know. The events business thing. I, I love events. It's like my own passion. When I ran a car club, we used to throw free events all the time. I love doing events. Um, you know, at some point, I want Hoonigan's name to be on like the biggest automotive festival in the world. So, how do we get there? We'll figure that out. But that's the goal. Or create it. Well, that's that's how we're gonna do it. <laughs> um, that's awesome, man. Um, just to get more personal, what's in your garage currently? Uh, my home garage right now. Uh, or like, what do, what do you own? Yeah. It could be here or there. Oh, I got a lot. Um, so I've got my kind of really my, my dream car is, uh, I've got a 1991 911 turbo, um, that's got the raw welt treatment to it. Um, I bought that car a decade ago and it was, it was my dream car when I bought it then. And when I bought it, it was, a you know, $35,000 car with 40,000 miles on it. I didn't know the air cooled world was going to explode like it has so now it's a yeah congratulations yeah now it's my son's uh my son's you know four-year tuition payment um i have uh what else do i have i have a 72 chevy nova with a 555 big block i have a land rover uh discovery with a r2.8 cummins swap that's in it and i'm trying to get running is that the um, two discovery two uh discovery one. Oh, the yeah, one yeah, yeah, yeah okay so it's like the it's basically a defender with a different body on it right um i finally got my defender it's the poor man's defender but it still works um but the cummins engine is going to make it great because those british motors it, it i don't want to get too into it but it's a british buick motor it's just a nightmare um <laughs> then i've got let's see what else i've got uh my wife has a 944 Turbo that we're doing an LS3 swap into. Nice. I have an Audi Coupe Quattro that I bought the day I got my job at Rides as a present to myself. And it's still, it's running now, but like it has been the forever project and it's just been a huge joke with my friends. And now it's a huge joke with our entire audience about how like Scott just never works on his Audi. I'm just really busy. Um, I've seen those videos. Yeah. And then, yeah, the car cane rehab videos. And then uh, my wife also has a Cayenne GTS six speed, which is what we bought for, um, we bought when uh, we got pregnant and uh well, I mean, technically she got pregnant but you're supposed to say we these days but um we got that and it's uh it's fantastic but i actually think we're gonna sell it because 
It's uh, I'm six foot eight, and when I push the seat back, there's like no room in the back for her and the baby, so it just doesn't really make a lot of sense. We're gonna, I used to have an eight L. I think we're gonna get another one of those. I love that. It's just a great car, and they're so cheap. After if you don't buy them new, like they lose half their value in one year. It's so. a driving living room. Yeah, too. it totally is. So it's fantastic. It's great, and the S eight's a great version too with a Lambo engine in it. Um, what else do we have? I feel like I'm blanking on some things here. Um, oh, my wife has an F100, uh, 1971 F100 with a 360 in it. We're putting a built 390 in it right now. Um, it's a problem when you have so many cars. I have a car that's called Rail Car. It's basically a Cadillac flathead engine from 1940s uh, sitting in a 1929 Model A frame uh, with no body, just center center seat. But... Uh, that was once a car and now it's just like a bunch of pieces of metal in the corner. Um, but that's to go race the race, a gentleman race in Wildwood, New Jersey. So hopefully I get that together this year. Um, what else? Uh, it's a good thing you have a warehouse. Available. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've got, <laughs> there's a lot. Um, and then I have a car that I haven't told anyone about yet. I'll tell you about that afterwards, but I don't want anyone to know I own it because the minute people know I own it, then the t- then like the, the game clock starts. And people are going to be like, why haven't you worked on it? I just don't want anyone to ask oh, I me see. about it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's one of those, I bought it because it's, it's sentimental to me. It's a car that my dad had before I was born. And I spent my whole life hearing about it, you know, because my dad had to sell it when I was born. So I found one super cheap and it was one of those, I bought it. It's going to sit for years and I'll eventually get working on it. So cool. Yeah. I think that's it. I don't know. I got a few other projects that are like hidden away and, Oh, I can't believe I can't remember all the cars I own. That's so bad. This is what a car came problem sounds like. It's, anyway, it's, uh, it's all good. Um, real quick, hardest part of the business for you? What's been the hardest thing? Um, growth. Growth is hard. It was really easy when there was five of us. I think that as you grow as a company, it's really hard to instill your vision into more and more and more people. Not because those people can't understand it, but they don't get to spend as much time with you. Like living it. Yeah, too. and, and I, I don't want to make this, I, I try to say this without like, you know, removing ego from it. But when you're running a company, like you need to be a visionary, right? You do. Like you, there's that one person that needs to really lead the vision. A lot of other people play into that vision. There's a lot of people at this company who've done massively important things in moving it forward. But someone has to have that visionary lead. And as you get further away from the people who are making stuff every day, it's harder to spend that time with them. So you'll see that a lot of the guys here who have really have developed their own vision are people that I was able to spend a lot of time with early on. Guys like Hurt, where it used to just be me and Hurt and two other people. So we were able to talk a lot about ideas and get through it. And now it's just a lot of business. I mean, you saw my you know, my assistant just come to the window and do the let's wrap right. it up let's conversation it because up. there's I have another meeting that I have to walk into right now. Um, I really wish in some ways we could pump the brakes and slow things down. It always feels like there's, there's too much going on. Um, you know, I, I say this term a lot, which is it's a, when you say it, it's one of those things where you, where I don't know how to, I'll just say it. I say that sometimes I feel like we're drowning in opportunity and that's a really difficult thing because it's kind of a positive problem. It, it's a positive problem. And when you're not drowning in opportunity, you look at the people who are and you're like, you know, with disdain, like, oh, well, screw you. But one of the most difficult things I think for me just as a person is deciding which opportunity is the best opportunity, Sure, you know, and you asked before of like, you know, do you have any regrets or would you change anything or do things different? And, you know, maybe it's chasing a different opportunity, you know, and that that's one that's just so difficult is what is the right opportunity to chase? Um, what is it that, you know, was, you know, did you choose the wrong fork you know in the road when you were going there but it's best off not to think back and also realize that opportunities usually if it's a really good opportunity um and it was it'll it'll represent itself you know i've found that you know the the, the media thing it represents itself so, although there's other times where i've had great ideas i've they've never come back so what uh, what's been easy for you easy um huh. i don't know i don't know if any of it's easy um it's it, working hard comes easy to me, but it has massive consequences. 
if that makes sense. Like I don't mind putting in a 15 hour day. I enjoy it. I, I, I love what I do. And because of that, I'll work those hours. But now I have a wife, I have a seven week old son at home or congrats, thanks, man. Thanks. That's thanks. Awesome. And like, it changes your perspective, you know, it really does. Um, but you know, so I, like the work itself, I feel like comes easy. Uh, I wish I had more time to do it. I think that that's the problem. Like I don't mind getting down and doing the work. I love doing the creative. I love doing all of that. But it's yeah, it's it's juggling that with the rest of your life. You know? Right on, man. Well, we have to wrap it up. Do you have any? I mean, I'll give you. I, you got one last question. We got two minutes. Um, I, I run everything right to the edge. So. Okay. <laughs> um, like, what's your dream three car garage? Dream three car garage. I mean, one of them I already have. So nine eleven turbo. turbo yeah. uh, other car would be uh, an Audi. Uh, I mean, if I'm going to say dream, it would probably be an Audi S one. Um, and then the other car, man, am I going to have just Audis and Porsches in my garage when I do well, this? We're both VW yeah. branded yeah. nuts. So um, I, I would say probably the last one, just because of my current life situation. This is a car I really want to build. Is I want to build a D3 Audi 8L, right, which is the third generation of the big body 8L, but I want a manual six-speed transmission in it with a V10 that's in the S8 in it with twin turbo, right? Because I and th- because I want like the ultimate dad mobile that would so basically what an RS like eight would be like what would an yeah, R? I was gonna say it's like, like the car in Ronin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like I want an S eight with nitrous. Like yeah. that's I, that would be the perfect car. Um, the D two is a little smaller. I like the size and I like the look of that car. But I would want everything in it to be brand new. Like I want it to be like zero mile because I love that car. But as it gets to like a hundred thousand miles, it starts to develop a lot of problems. And then throw like a so, Bentley interior in it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I actually really enjoy the interior that's currently in it. But yeah, you know yeah. that is a Bentley. I mean, Bentleys were built on that chassis. They were except. I think the Audi one's aluminum and the Bentley one's actually not. But like, yeah, it, it's it's very much in line. But something like that because I think. I hate to say it, but I'm 40 and life's becoming a bit more practical and I need a more practical car. Dude, I, but, we're the same age, yeah. man. I feel you. Yeah, <laughs> nar- narrowing it down to three is tough, though. I mean, then there's a bunch of other ones on there that are like Jaguar E-Type, Ferrari 355. Uh, I really want to build a really nice Mark One Rabbit 1979 with an ABF swap in it. Um, just because I wanted that car when I was younger and I couldn't afford to build it, so I want to go back and build it now. Uh, yeah, it's it's tough. And then and then I I can't forget about the muscle car side. I mean, I love my Nova. Um, yeah, I really want to build a, another car that has been in my head recently. I wanted to build, so I want to take like an F800 or an F600 old body style like truck and chain and convert it into a crew cab. So take like an F250 crew cab and put it on it. So like a dent side, like late seventies truck. So it's basically like a, like a dump truck, but with a truck bed on it, like just as a big badass truck. Cause I miss my old truck. I used to have a big F350. I don't know, man. There's so many cars. It's that that's that's a that's its own show. It's we a, could talk yeah. About that I mean, day. it's a candy store. I was gonna say, man, like we, we could totally keep going forever <laughs> because we're just scratching the surface on customizing cars. Well, we'll have and, to do another episode then. Yeah, so. for sure. It's great to see you, man. Yeah, like, man. It's been good to catch up. It's kind of crazy. Good luck with everything on Standard H. I, yeah. I do like the logo. It's a good logo. So, <laughs> Cheers, man. Um, yeah, and uh, we'll we'll do this again. Absolutely. Thanks, Bye, Brian. Man. I'd like to thank Brian once again for taking the time. It was great to see him. Uh, Thank all of you for listening to this week's edition of the Standard Age Podcast. We'll have another episode coming at you in two weeks' time. Hope all of you are doing well and keeping safe out there. Please don't forget to rate and review this podcast. It really does help other people find it. And, of course, if you're not subscribing, please do subscribe. Uh, Thanks so much. Bye, everyone. Bye.